Hello, welcome back to another breaking news update. My name is Jimmy Boyd and you were watching Boyd News. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm back with some more updates coming out from the war between Russia and Ukraine. And we've got some big topics to discuss today. We're going to talk some more about long-range strikes inside of Russia. Will Ukraine be given the permission sometime in the next week or so to strike targets inside of Russian territory and go after their military airfields, uh, command centers, whatever it might be that Ukraine wants to strike? using Western-made weapons. So we're going to discuss that some more today. As European Parliament called for restrict, lifting restrictions on Western weapons just in the last 24 hours, they held a vote on a resolution calling for the lifting of restrictions for these weapons. 425 deputies voted in favor, 131 against, and 63 abstained. So a large majority voted in favor of this resolution to allow Ukraine to strike targets in Russia, so I think it's highly likely we're going to see support building up for this. I also reported to you guys just in the last week that Russia was moving a lot of their uh, warships away from, uh, you know, close to Ukraine, moving them further down the coast. I think it was to the uh, city of Sochi. It was ri originally uh, a lot of their Black Sea fleet were stationed at the port of Novorossiysk, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it's very close to like Crimea. And they started moving them further away, okay? And this is most likely to protect their ships as uh, Ukraine is most likely going to be given permission at some time in the near future to strike inside of Russia. So we'll see if that happens. And we know that Volodymyr Zelensky is supposed to be meeting in the, in the U.S. Uh, sometime next week to meet with President Biden, present a victory plan. And then also he's scheduled to meet with uh, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump as well. And then we also have the UN General Assembly going on next week. So lots of big things happening uh, sometime next week leading into Friday. We should be hearing potentially that Ukraine can now strike inside of Russian territory. Okay, we've also got numerous other reports. I've got some updates uh, coming out from today in regards to uh, just in the last like 24, 36 hours ago, we had that major uh, ammo depot or ammo storage facility up in the Tavir region in Russia that was struck by Ukraine. Massive fireball that we showed you guys the other day. So I've got some updates in regards to that. And then also Russia struck Sumi in the last 24 hours also. And we had like an elderly home that was struck. Hundreds of people uh, were inside. We had several wounded and uh, one person lost their life. So we're going to talk about that also today. So let's go ahead and start hopping into the news. Let me show you some of these details coming out here. This is from War Translated Dimitri on X. The presidential office confirms Zelensky's upcoming visit to the United States. In particular, the president will meet with Biden and present him with Ukraine's victory plan. He is also scheduled to meet with Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. In addition, Zelensky will address the UN General Assembly and hold bilateral talks with leaders of countries and international organizations. So something big coming out when it comes to this information is this whole victory plan. And we're hearing that a large part of this victory plan has to do with long-range strikes inside of Russia. And I'm also going to show you guys a video pretty soon from a professor talking about this. That basically Ukraine needs to be given the ability to strike inside Russia. This war should not only be conducted inside of Ukrainian territory. Uh, that Ukraine should be able to strike Russia. And I really think there's so much support building up behind this that it's highly likely very soon we are going to see Ukraine being given the ability to strike inside of Russia. So we also had this report coming out from RBC Ukraine. EU Parliament calls for lifting restrictions on strikes on Russia. MP support resolution. Okay, this came out today, September 19, 2024. It says here, members of the European Parliament have called on European Union EU countries to lift restrictions on Ukraine's use of Western weaponry for strikes on Russian territory. They supported a corresponding resolution citing the European Parliament. Okay, so according to the voting results, as I mentioned earlier, 425 members supported the resolution. 131 were against. 63 abstained. The resolution says that Ukraine needs the removal of these restrictions to fully exercise its right to self-defense and not be vulnerable to attacks on its population and infrastructure. The Parliament emphasized that a shortage of ammunition, weapons, and restrictions on their use could undermine the efforts made so far in terms of support. MEPs once again urged the EU to fulfill its 2023 promise to supply 1 million rounds of ammunition, as well as to accelerate the provision of weapons, air defense systems, or ADS, and Taurus cruise missiles. They, the MEPs, also restate 
their position that all EU countries and NATO allies should collectively and individually commit to annual military support for Ukraine militarily of no less than 0.25% of their GDP, says the European Parliament website. Okay, so European Parliament coming out big, showing uh, a major uh, show of support for Ukraine and pushing for lifting restrictions on strikes inside of Russia, also making sure they're getting the weaponry that they need, the ammunition that they need, and making sure that European nations are committing and uh, staying committed to Ukraine, making sure they get the proper support that is needed. Okay, so that was big news. Also, in regards to the European Parliament calling for strikes on Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, this is uh, from Nexta, the Speaker of the Russian State Duma has commented on the European Parliament's call for strikes on Russia. The European uh, Parliament's call for strikes on Russia leads to a world war with the use of nuclear weapons, State Duma Speaker Vyacheslav Volodin wrote in his Telegram channel. He promised to give a tough answer with use of more powerful weapons and also called on the European Parliament to dissolve itself. The Duma Speaker added that the approach time of a Sarmat missile to uh, Strasbourg, Strasbourg uh, is 3 minutes and 20 seconds. So once again, Russia coming out and warning that long-range strikes inside of Russian territory will trigger a major war between NATO and Russia, potentially even a nuclear war, and that's basically what the State Duma uh, was mentioning here in his Telegram post, obviously speaking very provocatively and what many people would say is insane, but uh, who knows what's going to happen here, but it's definitely, you know, we're on the verge of a major war breaking out. We'll have to see if this is another red line that just gets crossed and Russia does not respond to it. Uh, but in my opinion, as I've been telling you guys for a while, I, I believe that uh, Russia will respond to this heavily. Now, will it be nuclear? Uh, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. But I think Russia will respond to this and it could definitely potentially lead to a major war between NATO and Russia. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. Also, now we're going to talk about this professor that I was mentioning earlier. This is from uh, Ast Astraya. To a large degree, the Russians have been able to control the strategic discourse, setting up for new uh, setting us setting up for us, excuse me, new rules in war which have never existed before. Like, for example, that when you invade another country, the entire war should take place on the on the territory of the country that was invaded. It's completely absurd, and yet somehow it's accepted in the United States as normal, says Prof uh, Professor Timothy Snyder. So he's an American, uh, an American uh, historian and a professor, and he he comes out speaking at this conference talking about long-range strikes inside of Russia, and that Ukraine basically should be able to do this, that the war should not only be fought inside of Ukraine's borders. And then he also talks a little bit about uh, Ukraine. What they're trying to do right now is put major pressure on Russia, make it appear to Russia that they're losing this war, so that way they can trigger in their own minds and say, hey, we're losing this war, maybe we need to come to the drawing table with Ukraine. That's why Ukraine's striking all these ammo depots and trying to uh, destroy their military capabilities as much as possible, go after their oil depots as well. So he's going to talk about those different things in this video. It's two minutes long, so just pay attention to what he has to say. I thought he had some good information here. Take a look. Part of being an empire is controlling the discourse. And to a large degree, the Russians have been able to control the strategic discourse, setting up for us new rules in war, which have never existed before. Like, for example, that when you invade another country, the entire war should take place on the territory of the country you've invaded. No one has ever said that before because it's completely absurd. And yet somehow it's been accepted in the United States as normal that this war should be fought on Ukrainian territory. There is no precedence for that kind of idea. Another idea that the Russians have that we've accepted is that it's normal, for example, when you and I were in Kiev for ballistic missiles to rain down on the city where we were trying to do normal business, but it's somehow not normal for ballistic missiles from Ukraine to go into Russia. Why is that? Why is it normal for one country and not for another? It has a great deal to do with imperial thinking, which we have accepted. There's something precious, special, et cetera, about Russia, and somehow it's okay for Ukrainians to be victims because they always have been victims. We need to investigate, I think, that understructure of thinking, which I believe has guided our policy in the wrong way. So as, as far as empires are concerned, I'll return to, my, to what I said at the end, trying to respond now to your question about a victory plan. I believe the Ukrainians are right about something that they've been, that they're hard pressed to convince us of. And I think what I'm saying now is consistent with the history of empire. The Russians are going to negotiate peace when they believe they are losing. 
And so if anyone is serious about negotiation, that, that, that person should be trying to get the Russians into a position where they think they might be losing. The Ukrainians get that, but they're having a really hard time making us understand that pairing. So when they talk about a victory plan or a peace plan, what they mean is together the West and Ukraine do enough to get Russia to a point where it might negotiate sincerely. They're not there now. Outstanding. Thank you. Interesting, right? Um, so, you know, he definitely appears to have a very logical uh, take on this whole war inside of, uh, of Ukraine with Russia. And that, you know, how he mentions that, uh, you know, this war should not only be fought in the borders of Ukraine, that it's absurd to think like that, that Ukraine should be able to strike inside of Russia. And then him also mentioning that, uh, you know, they're trying to get Russia into a position where they feel like they're losing so that they'll come to the uh, negotiating table with Ukraine and try to end this war. So that's also uh, what I believe is going to be a large part of Ukraine's victory plan when they present this to, you, to the United States is to finally let them strike inside of Russia, start hammering their airfields, hammer critical infrastructure, whatever it might be, so they feel like they're losing the war. And uh, maybe this could potentially push Russia into negotiating. And I think that may be what Zelensky's plan is. And I'm sure there's probably more in that victory plan that we're not even aware of that will probably be revealed to an extent sometime next week once we start to hear about it. So I'm very curious to hear what we're going to find out with that victory plan. But the professor here definitely had some good key points to talk about in regards to this war. So I hope you guys like that. Also, now we're going to move on to Sumi. I've just got this one post talking about this. Vice Grad 24 breaking. Russia bombs a nursing home for the elderly in Sumi. Many elderly Ukrainians wounded, one killed. Okay, so this is an example of why uh, Ukraine wants to be able to strike inside of Russia. Uh, from what I understood, I believe these may have been glide bombs that struck this uh, facility here. Lots of sick and elderly people were inside of here uh, when these bombs were hitting this building. And you can see the devastation here. All these people having to be outside on the ground as they had to evacuate as many people from the facility. So take a look. All right, so pretty sad to see, right? I mean, these are just innocent elderly people. Many of them are probably sick, suffering from diseases or whatever it might be inside of this uh, this elderly home when it was struck by bombs. Um, and, and again, you know, this is the reason why Ukraine wants to be able to strike their airfields. If these are glide bombs striking Sumi, which most likely they are, uh, you know, these bombs are, are launched from very far away, okay? And it's these Su-34 fighter bombers that they use uh, are the same aircraft that Ukraine would like to go after and destroy. So uh, this is exactly the reason why we're moving this direction inside the war with Ukraine. And uh, we'll see if Ukraine is going to be able to strike back at some point soon. So very sad to see that report. Now I've got some updates coming out from Doropets. We talked about this city just yesterday, uh, the night before uh, just about 48 hours ago, we had a major strike on this uh, storage facility that had tons of ammunition here. Okay, lots of missiles were stored here. Iskander ballistic missiles, I think Tachka U missiles were stored here. Uh, tons of different types of weaponry at this facility up in Toropets in the Tavir region. We've got an update here from Brady Afric. The Russian ammunition depot recently struck by Ukraine is still smoldering in new satellite imagery from today. More than 100 drones were reportedly used to in the attack on this site. So we've got some satellite imagery showing this place still smoking um, as it was damaged. And we can see a lot of these, uh, these bunkers here are black, okay, meaning they've been destroyed. And we saw that huge fireball. I showed you guys the video footage yesterday. It was absolutely gigantic. It looked like a nuclear blast, okay? So uh, this facility definitely was hit very hard. We can see all the smoke and everything. All these trees have been burned out. So a lot of these were definitely damaged. I'm sure Russia incurred millions, if not billions, in dollars and losses when this facility was struck by drones just the other night. So very crazy, right? Also, in regards to this same facility, this is from Noel Reports. Pro-Russian blogger Anastasia uh, Kasha, Kasha, Kasha Varova, if I'm saying that right, 
claim the dozens of Russian soldiers likely died in the recent explosion at the Toropets Ammunition Depot. She criticized the facility's design, which was said to be capable of withstanding a nuclear blast, and expressed outrage that uh, there were no remains of the soldiers due to the scale of the explosion. Okay, so this was the original transcript on Telegram uh, from this pro-Russian blogger stating that uh, apparently a lot of the soldiers who were here at this facility potentially died, right, from these blasts. And, and again, I showed you guys that video footage yesterday. It was absolutely, you know, horrific to see. Um, and we, we have video footage today, too, showing some of the damages in the area of people's homes from the blast, the shock wave that came from this facility when it blew up, okay? It was absolutely massive. Um, so this is what was being reported from this pro-Russian blogger, okay? So very crazy, right? So uh, I pulled up this video again. We'll go ahead and watch it one more time today. I showed this to you guys yesterday, but I got more information in regards to what this strike was. Now, we had this video that showed some sort of facility coming under attack here, and there was Russian soldiers outside, and what was being reported that it was a drone that attacked this facility. But when we listen to the video, it definitely does not sound like a drone. It sounds more like a missile coming in. So was this the Palinitsia drone? Uh, rocket drone that Ukraine has or maybe some of their Neptune missiles who really knows but I've got this report here from Ukraine battle map Ukraine struck a Russian military facility south of uh, Rechista or Rechitsa if I'm saying that right in the Bryansk region okay so this was in the Bryansk region we didn't have this information yesterday 60 kilometers from Ukraine the person recording it said it was a UAV however it sounded like a missile strike and could be Ukraine's new missile drone or another long-range missile being used so we'll go ahead and watch this one more time this was a video that was popping up all over X yesterday and I showed this to you guys just in case you haven't seen it yet take a look what do you got? Yeah, <laughs> Okay, all right, pretty frightening, right? So these Russian soldiers are standing outside, and then all of a sudden you hear what appears to be some sort of missile coming in, striking this facility, that building there behind them. And they weren't too far away. They're lucky to be alive, considering that this thing struck that. So it makes me wonder if maybe it was one of those rocket drones that Ukraine has, the Palinitsia, but we don't, we don't really know what it was. But again, according to this information, uh, it, it was definitely at a Russian military facility south of Rechitsa, in the Bryansk region of Russia, okay? This is where this attack took place according to Ukraine battle map. So I thought I would update you guys with that as yesterday we didn't have that information. Also from War Translated Dmitry, this is going to be video footage coming out from the aftermath from Toropets, which is the city where that uh, major ammo storage facility was at that had all those missiles that exploded just the other night. So take a look at this as well. Сейчас мы посмотрим, что куда как. Чуть-чуть покажу вам, что произошло здесь. Дома вот эти все, все соседние, всех все выбито, вынесено. Все стекла вынесло, короче. Конкретно, хочу сказать. Вот, смотрите. Внутри все, все в стекла, все выбито. Вот так все, ребят, здесь. Вот в таком сейчас состоянии. All right, so pretty crazy to see that, right? So whenever this thing exploded, it blew out so many people's windows all throughout the area. That's how huge this explosion was. And I think it was even measuring like a 2.8 on the Richter scale, uh, similar you know, to like a, an earthquake, okay? It triggered a small earthquake um, that was picked up on uh, seismic meters all throughout this area, okay? So very crazy to see that, guys. Thought I would share that video footage with you. So let's move on to our next update now from Max24. The Russians mined the dams in the Belgorod region, says OTU Kharkiv. They are probably preparing provo uh, provocations that will further accuse Ukraine of environmental and humanitarian consequences. 
So I thought this was interesting because we have been reporting to you guys a lot over the last couple weeks that Belgorod has been coming under heavy attack by the Ukrainians. We've been seeing lots of missiles flying into Belgorod recently and even striking like residential areas. Okay, I showed video footage not too long ago, maybe like in the last week of uh, missiles hitting inside of uh, cities in Belgorod and or the Belgorod region and striking cars and, and uh, homes and, and things like that. So uh, definitely lots of civilian infrastructure being targeted in, in the Belgorod region recently from Ukraine. And uh, what based on this information, what we're hearing is that the Russians may attempt to blow some of the dams and maybe blame this on Ukraine, maybe have some more reason to strike harder inside of Ukraine, go after their critical infrastructure, who knows. Uh, but just in case we see something happen, I thought I would share this with you in case we actually do see these uh, these dams being blown over here inside of Russia. OK, so also from PS01, Russians continue to surrender. So we've got this video footage showing more Russians all throughout probably the Kursk region uh, is probably what I would assume. We've seen a lot of video footage of Russians in the Kursk region uh, that are surrendering to the Ukrainians. So we've got more video footage showing that. So very crazy. It looks like more Russians continuing to surrender and also replenishing the exchange fund uh, fund for uh, for Ukraine. So that way they can get a lot more of their troops back. Right. OK, so let's keep moving here. OK, so also this from Bliskovka. Romania asked Ukraine to shoot down Russian drones flying into its territory. It says Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably not. Sorry, guys. NATO country Romania asked the head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Andriy uh, uh, Sibia, in uh, Bucharest to shoot down Russian drones, the newspaper reported. Okay, so this newspaper were coming out and saying that Romania apparently asked Ukraine to please shoot down the drones that are flying into its territory. Isn't that kind of crazy? That NATO that should be protecting themselves is not protecting their own airspace. They want Ukraine to protect their own airspace while they're being attacked by the Russians continuously almost every day. Isn't that insane? Um, I know that uh, Romania has been coming out recently saying that they're trying to change some of their laws to allow uh, these drones to be shot down, that apparently there's some laws that are restricting that or something like that. So I don't know what's going on over here and why Romania would be doing this. I think that any NATO country should just be shooting down these drones if they come into their territory, as obviously this poses a threat. Okay, what if it crashes into a home or something like that? potentially injuring somebody or taking somebody's life. Now we could have a potential war breaking out. So definitely these drones should be shot down by the NATO nations, but they're literally asking Ukraine to do that for them. Isn't that crazy? All right, also guys, from Defense of Ukraine, Germany delivered another substantial military aid package to Ukraine. The package includes lots of things, as you can see here, 22 Leopard 1A5 tanks, 22 MRAPs, five BV, uh, BV-206 tracked all-terrain vehicles, one Warthog all-terrain tracked carrier, three Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, two TRML-4D air surveillance radars, 61,000 rounds of 155 millimeter ammunition, 30 vector reconnaissance drones, 20 RQ-35 uh, Hadron reconnaissance drones, 20 unmanned surface vessels, 12 Songbird reconnaissance drones, six Hornet XRs, three Beaver Bridge Lane tanks, one Dox Armored Engineer Vehicle, six uh, Wiesent, I don't know if it's Wiesent or Wiesent, one Mine Clearing Tanks, 16 Ground Surveillance Radars, two Amp Self-Protection Systems for Helicopters, two Border Protection Vehicles, Material for Explosive Ordnance Disposal, 112 Vehicles, Trucks, Minibuses, and All-Terrain Vehicles, eight Zetros uh, Tankers, 10 MG3 machine guns with 500, excuse me, spare barrels and breech blocks. 1 million rounds of ammunition for firearms. Thank you for your unwavering support. Isn't that crazy, guys? Look at all this support for Ukraine coming from Germany once again. Germany, I believe, is the second largest supporter of Ukraine. So definitely another major package going over to Ukraine very soon. And then we also have this in regards to Germany. Max24 reports Germany wants to deliver another weapons package worth 1.4 billion euros to Ukraine by the end of 2024, said the uh, the Spiegel, I don't know if it's Spiegel or Spiegel uh, magazine. Package includes an ammunition for Gepard, 20 Martyr, reconnaissance and attack drones, spare parts or weapon systems that have already been delivered. Okay, so what we're hearing 
is by the end of the year, potentially a major military aid package coming from Germany once again, 1.4 billion euros over to Ukraine. So that's big news too. Also from NOAA reports, India is supplying ammunition to Ukraine despite Russia's objections. European countries like the Czech Republic, Spain, and Italy are, are purchasing the ammunition, sending it to Ukraine. Russia has raised this issue twice with Indian representatives, but India has, not, has stated it is not directly supply, supplying Ukraine. Okay, so this is interesting, right? So India apparently is sending weaponry over to Ukraine, but it's passing through uh, European countries uh, like the Czech Republic, Spain, and Italy. They're purchasing this ammunition and then giving it over to Ukraine. So technically... Uh, we have India supplying ammunition over to Ukraine to fight against Russia. And I'm sure Vladimir Putin is not very happy with that. And also, I believe India is one of the largest uh, purchasers of uh, crude oil from Russia as well. Okay, so that was some big news coming out today. Also, we've got this video footage. Uh, I can't show the sound to it because it's got music. But it says, Ukrainian FPV drone collapses a house with Russian servicemen inside. Take a look at this, guys. Pretty crazy. I wanted to show you this on, on how devastating these little tiny drones are. You can see it right here. Little FPV drone, okay? It's not much bigger than what you'd see. There it is, boom. Then, uh, you know, what people use um, in the United States or, you know, is like a civilian-style drone, okay? They're very tiny. They attach bombs to these. We've seen RPG launchers. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, we've seen AK-47s attached to them, thermite, uh, dropping molten thermite all over forests. So look at how devastating just one of these are. And literally, these things can destroy tanks, too. I've seen them blow up tanks in literally one hit. So apparently, there were some Russian soldiers inside this building at the time while it was struck with that little mini FPV drone. And if you think about it, it's just so smart for Ukraine to be using these because they don't have to risk the life of a uh, uh, Ukrainian soldier. Um, they can literally just use a drone. And if it gets destroyed, they're not really worth much, okay? They're very tiny, but they seem to be very effective uh, to destroy many Russian positions. So now I'm going to show you a couple of things coming from Russia State TV. And this is in regards to some of the, uh, the, or the attacks that have been happening inside of Lebanon over the last couple of days. We've been reporting to you guys that uh, lots of electronic devices have been exploding inside of Lebanon. Uh, pagers, radios, electronic equipment and cars for motorcycles. Uh, I even saw like a, um, a, a tiny little like a moped that blew up as well. So lots of electronics all over Lebanon exploding. Israel had apparently tampered with a lot of electronic equipment that was uh, sent over to uh, Lebanon prior, like months back. And uh, Israel apparently detonated lots of electronic equipment. So now apparently the Russians appear to be uh, uh, afraid of this as well. So take a look at this from Anton Gershenko, Russian propagandist Sol uh, Soliovia. Solovyev, excuse me, is convinced that Europe is now producing explosive gadgets. Will he stop buying new devices now? You do realize that no one took apart tens of thousands of pagers, radios, tablets, phones, and planted the explosives. It means that European factories are now producing a new kind of weapon of mass destruction. And this, of course, is an act of terrorism. So what we do know is that, for example, the pagers that were being used by Hezbollah uh, operatives that were exploding in, in their pockets. Uh, these were originally from a company in Taiwan. And then we found out that some Hungarian company, I think it was a shell company or something like that, uh, was producing these uh, these pagers that had originally been created in, in uh, Hungary and then sent over to Iran. And then Iran handed these over uh, to Hezbollah, if I'm correct on that information, I believe so. And then, uh, you know, then that's when we had these things exploding. So take a look at what he has to say real quick. Russia definitely appears to be worried about this. Но то, что приходит на фронт, должен сразу работать. Работать идеально. И быть безопасным. Это не значит, что надо все изъять. Но голод надо включать. При этом, мы же понимаем, что произошло. Это же промышленного масштаба диверсия. Вы же понимаете, что это никто на коленке не разбирал тысячи пейджеров, радиостанций, планшетов, телефонов. Мы говорим о десятках тысяч, да, если только пейджеров было пять тысяч. И туда не закладывал. Нет, это значит, что европейские заводы производят сейчас новый вид оружия. А мы массового поражения. Массового поражения. При этом неизбирательного. То, что мы сейчас увидели, 
Конечно, это акт террора. Но то, что приходит на... Right, pretty crazy, right? I mean, I think he kind of has a point here because think about, you know, thousands of electronics that were that were being, uh, you know, exp they were exploding all over Lebanon just over the last couple days that, uh, you know, it's possible that these were not necessarily tampered with. They were actually designed to do this. They were built this way in the factories. And if many European countries were manufacturing these, then uh, yes, then, you know, this was obviously a massive scale operation because it was thousands of uh, electronic devices that were tampered with, right? So I've got one more thing that I want to show you also in regards to this. This was him speaking again. This is from Anton Gyrushenko. Russian media report that the ICOM V82 radios that exploded in Lebanon have been found on sale in Russia. It is also reported that a smartphone exploded in the hands of a Russian man on Arbat Street in Moscow during yesterday's cyber attack. Yes, that's true. I'll show you guys the article in a minute. Meanwhile, Russian propagandist Sol Sol uh, Solovyev is trying to blame the Ukrainians that nothing prevents them from gaining access to the same technologies and transfer humanitarian aid, such as communication equipment, to the war zone that will explode in the hands of Russians. So take a look at what he has to say here as well. Сейчас идет гуманитарная поставка. А что мешает хохлам получить, ну, например, через того же нету, на который работает СРДК? получить доступ к тем же самым технологиям и передать под видом гуманитарной помощи зону боевых действий через каких-нибудь таких же там криптохохлов, засланных сюда некоторое время назад с разными историями. Вот взять им и через них передать такую гуманитарочку, в которой, скажем, средства связи. У нас же много средств связи передает гражданское общество. Много. А потом эта партия вдруг начнет взрываться в руках. Вы можете гарантировать, что это не произойдет? Вот сейчас идет гуманитарная поставка. Okay, so pretty frightening, right, to think about this, that uh, obviously this is a new type of warfare that's going on now, and this is a mass scale, if you think about it, you know, thousands of devices. Um, I remember even when this happened, I started looking at my phone, and I was like, oh my goodness, like, what if my phone has that in it? We never know, right? Um, and uh, it's obviously a scary situation in regards to this, so I'm sure the Russians are definitely worried about this now. What if this starts happening to the Russians? What if Ukraine uh, gets access to this too, considering that they are also partnered with the West? And then we start seeing lots of uh, Russian equipment exploding too. I think it's very possible. And also considering that it says here, Russian media reported that the ICOM V82 radios that exploded in Lebanon have been found on sale in Russia. So these exact same radios that were exploding on the hips of uh, Hezbollah members in Lebanon are also being sold inside of Russia. So some of these uh, these weapons that are disguised as, de as electronic devices could be in the hands of Russians right now and could be detonated, right? So he's obviously worried about that. So also, I pulled this up just to show you guys. It really was a real story. This on uh, Eurasia Daily. A smartphone exploded at a Muscovite on Arbot Street during an Israeli cyber attack on Hezbollah. And it says here, the phone exploded in the hands of a Muscovite uh, on the Arbat during yesterday's Israeli cyber attack on Hezbollah militants. According to the Telegram channel, MASH, the Honor 70 smartphone, uh, exploded. The man was injured in the arm. He did not wait for the ambulance, ran away in an unknown direction. Eyewitnesses called the security services. Now they are looking for the victim and have been given the phone uh, to experts against the background of the latest news from Lebanon Law enforcement officers decided to check the device whether it was from the batch of equipment that was replaced in the Middle East market. Israeli intelligence Mossad, however, apparently the honor was just uh, just overheated the battery, writes TK. Okay, so I thought it was interesting that this thing exploded in the same time that uh, we had these uh, all these devices exploding in Lebanon, right? So it was obviously a very major event that I covered over the last couple of days over there. And if this happened to be connected to that, where this phone exploded at the same time, and maybe it was a device that was tampered with as well, uh, then I think it's it's very possible to to assume here that these devices that were being used, because not all also in uh, Lebanon were they blowing up, but as well in uh, Syria they were exploding too. So you know, were these things connected to satellites? How were they triggered? We don't even know all those details yet. We just know that explosives were planted inside of them. So that was very big news that I wanted to share with you guys. So a couple more things to go over here before we get you out of here. This is from Nexta. The EU is allocating $160 million to Ukraine, including $100 million from the proceeds of frozen Russian assets to help in the energy sector. 
EC chief Ursula von der Leyen has said, Ukraine has lost half of its energy infrastructure, about nine gigawatts, and the population may be left without heating and water in the winter. EU plans to restore 3.5 gigawatts of capacity, which would cover 15% of Ukraine's electricity needs. Lithuania dismantles power plant uh, to be rebuilt in Ukraine. So we're not going to watch this video because it's kind of redundant. I basically just went over that information for you. And this video is getting kind of long, so I want to get you guys on your way. But it uh, looks like the EU is going to be helping out Ukraine a lot with their energy sector, considering that a lot of it has been destroyed. I've covered majority of those hits on Ukrainian uh, energy infrastructure throughout the majority of this year has just been heavily damaged. Okay, a large majority of it is gone. So by the winter time, when Ukraine is uh, cranking up the heat, trying to stay warm, they may have a uh, humanitarian crisis and not a enough energy for all their consumers to keep the heat on and the lights on. So that could definitely be a major problem. So it looks like the EU is going to try to do their best to help out with that. Finally, one last thing from Max24. About 40,000 Russian troops have already been diverted to the Kursk region. Advances of AFU continues and the exchange fund is replenished. Okay, this was according to Volodymyr Zelensky. So he's saying that 40,000 Russian troops have already been diverted to the Kursk region, most likely coming from the eastern side of Ukraine. So this is very big news. And uh, we heard from Zelensky just in the last week. He was saying that they were expecting 50 to 60,000 uh, troops to start pulling away from the eastern front. And we also heard some reports saying that uh, the Russians were starting to give up their advance on the east and not pushing as much, starting to more heavily focus on the Kursk region as the uh, incursion is starting to spread over there to more areas. We've been talking about that. Today, we didn't have too many updates in regards to Kursk, so I wasn't really able to share much. But we did have this information from Volodymyr Zelensky, so I thought I would get you guys caught up with that. So yeah, hopefully we'll get some more information regarding the Kursk region. But right now, it looks like most of the news is focused on what's going to be happening next week. Will Ukraine be able to uh, strike inside of Russian territory using long-range weapons? We'll see what happens. But that's going to be it for today's update. If you got something out of this, please smash that like button. Also, if you enjoy my content, please consider subscribing down below. Hit the notification bell, that way YouTube can notify you with that. Hope you all have a great day. Everybody take care and God bless, and we'll see you in the next one.